Hello. This podcast is available unedited and ad-free at patreon.com slash Hamilton Morris. Each month, I release three to four new podcasts, and it was Patreon exclusive until recently. Many people contacted me and said they wanted me to figure out a way to make it freely available, and so I decided to accept sponsorship from a few of my friends. One of them is David Rentlin, the founder of a company called Lucy Nicotine. They make nicotine gum, nicotine pouches, nicotine lozenges, some of which are made with synthetic nicotine, which I think is pretty cool. Now, if you don't already use nicotine, I recommend that you don't start. It's habit forming. But if you already do use nicotine products, and especially if you smoke tobacco cigarettes, I can say that this is a cleaner product. And it's also a product that I use personally. If you go to lucy.co and use the code Hamilton, you get 20% off your purchase. This podcast is also brought to you by MindCure, a Canadian life sciences company producing synthetic ibogaine that is also engaged in psychedelic research with MDMA. They're doing some cool work and I'm on their board of advisors. Lastly, this podcast is brought to you by Top Tree Herbs, an herbal tea company founded by my friend and pharmacopoeia producer, Soren Shade. This is not a traditional sponsorship in that I'm not receiving any money from them, but Soren is actually a producer on this podcast. They grow their own kratom domestically in Appalachia in a greenhouse, which is very beautiful. And they source leaves internationally, do third-party testing. I've been to the lab where they do the testing. They test for heavy metals and other adulterants, and it's ethically sourced in tea bag form. You can find their teas at toptreeherbs.com. My involvement started when I was like um, just walking down the street, you know what I mean? I was like 19 years old or whatever. It was around 69 or 70. Um, and this guy came up to me and said, we have this new product and I have a whole shitload of it. I want to give away as a publicity thing. Check it out. And they showed me the clear light. And then, you know, for the next month or something, I just went around and gave away as much of it as I could. Um to great effect, you know what I mean? Um, the, you know, like the, con the things that impressed me about the manufacturer was how important it was, at least in the facility I showed. And that was the second place. There was another place also, um, a, a lab previous to that, uh, was the air filtration. What, you know, and it, because it had to be like a clean room, like when working with computer stuff, you know, and so, like, because he didn't want any dust or dirt to get into it because, you know, it was, like, so thin and clear, so it had to be, like, a really clean room. You know, the other thing was when the facility was shut down, when we shut it down and moved, um, wow, the amount of money I had to... I, I freaked out that somebody would come along because we moved out of that place that somebody would come along and get stoned, you know, from anything that was residual left behind. So it was like, you know, thousands upon thousands of dollars. I had three different crews come in and completely clean the place to where you could, you know, eat off the floor. And then I did it again, again you know and I mean, and again to make sure because I just had nightmares about what if some little kid touches someplace on the wall, you know what I mean? Where the, where there was something there. Um, the, wow. you know, ultimately, you know, the, um, the thing was that, um, the forces of commercialism in the LSD world really destroyed clear light. I mean, there were a lot of people that liked it and bought it, but the run of the mill dealer, you know what I mean? They were, they wanted the cheapest thing where they could make the biggest profit. And my involvement and numerous of the people I knew who were involved, it was not about profit. It wasn't about money. It was like a holy mission, you know, um, to the extent of if other, if someone within the, the distribution network called it window pane, our orders were from the top to drop that person. Don't distribute it to them, cut them off. If they didn't call it clear light, then they were not down with the, um, you know, sacred part of it or what have you. Um, 
No, it was um, all batches. Because there were numerous batches, you know, of the clear light, and there were actually numerous labs. Um, some people made really amateur versions, and that was clear from the get-go, and, and that didn't fly. But um, even with the very best clear light, you know, some people, they didn't want to call it clear light. They didn't want to put a uh, spiritual spin on it. And the distributors, the major big people with it, did put a uh, spiritual spin on it. And so they were really irked when people called it uh, window pay. Because they were going, no, they're, it's... It's clear light, you know, the clear light of the void, blah, 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 blah. And and so they, you know, instructed us, if somebody calls it window pane or you catch somebody selling it and calling it window pane, cut that person off. You know what I mean? We, uh, we're, uh, we're on a trip, you know what I mean? One of the, the, the person who approached me on the street, who was uh, in with, um, you know, the people who were doing the synthesis, that guy... Um, he ended up being thrown out of the organization because he went and bought, he made money. He was in it for the money and he went and bought a bunch of sports cars and they told him, no, you can't have any more of our product. This is not about sports cars. You know what I mean? Um, oh. you know, if you want, if you want to spurge and buy a small statue of a Buddha, you can do that. You know what I mean? But you can't drive out on the road with, you know, the, you know, sports cars. You know, the story, of course, that I tell with it, you know, that to me was the big deal with Steve Jobs, you know what I mean, who, you know, took one look at the, I showed him, you know, he was, first he came over because they were like, he was selling the uh, blue boxes, you know, at the drug dealer so that you could use a payphone without paying. Um, but he was also there to score acid and say, so like, you know, to impress this young guy, I showed him, you know, the wooden boxes with the 40 little uh, glass bottles, you know what I mean? Plastic, actually. And um, and I showed it to him. His eyes bugged out of his head. I said, you know, the regular grams of commercial tabs are around 500, although sometimes we've got it as cheap as 300 for 4,000 tablets. Uh, you know what I mean? The orange sunshine was 800 for 4,000. But the clear light was, you know, 1,200 to 1,500 for 4,000. So it was selling for triple the same dose in a pill form. And he saw, you know what I mean? Like this fascinated, the packaging was what allowed the people to sell it for triple the price. You know what I mean? He not only, Steve Jobs not only really loved clear light, you know what I mean? And mentioned that in his Department of Defense interview, but he, you know, um, he was totally taken, you know, the look on his face was to me unforgettable. And I do think that it had to do with, uh, how he later marketed, uh, um, you know, the Apple products was like, you know, he, his eyes bugged out of his head, you know what I mean? He was like, what? You know I mean, there was a mountain of tablets on the table, and then I, right beside it, I set the little box of that, and I said, and this, <laughs> check this out, you know. Um, wow, like, that's amazing. You know, he, of course, you know, would have been one of the people if he had kept on coming around that would have gotten to 86 because he was into money. <laughs> you know what I mean? He would have ended up calling it window pain. Well, maybe not. He went to India, so maybe he would have maintained the spiritual you know, thing with it. I think he was, he wanted to make money, uh, you know, especially like trying to sell the blue boxes, you know, that, that, that uh, Wozniak, I believe, was making them. Um, but he, you know, but uh, no, I think he was paranoid going to jail. You know what I mean? Um, straight right. up. I mean, because the, the, the heat was, you know, everywhere. You know, he also, I believe, if I recall correctly, he was there um, when Jack Leary was hanging out with too, because uh, some of the crystal LSD that we were getting it, which was the sunshine crystal that Scully and uh, Sand were producing. Um, but like, uh, you know. Jack Leary was who Tim Leary Summers who was selling me the crystal, the sunshine crystal, and he was. In, Jobs saw that um, Leary's son was at the apartment, and at that time, um, you know, Leary was very controversial. I believe that was after he had been sprung from jail, and so like um, Jobs freaked out. You know what I mean? Um, because he saw that how much heat that was. In fact, I was paranoid as hell, too, you know what I mean? Because I would happen to have been a fugitive at the time. Um, you know, it wasn't 
like the Wild West in Berkeley. But I mean, you, you, it's hard to for people to understand how much LSD there was. I mean, there was just really a lot. You know, you would go to somebody's house and they would have a fifty-gallon barrel filled with tablets. You know what I mean? Like millions, millions. <laughs> you know, like you go, you go there. Like you know, I lived in this building, and on the top floor was a um, professor. You know what I mean? He ran a tabling machine, you know what I mean? And then underneath him was the distributor and then the basically the retailer. You know, at that point retail was like, you know, a minimum of ten thousand doses, you know what I mean? Uh that was considered retail. Really it was overproduced, uh, basically is what happened, I think. You know what I mean? Like it was like, you know, I mean in a in a typical week I would be, you know, offered a hundred different types of tablets. Um, did you ever see it being synthesized? Um, no, I did not. I avoided um, all synthesis facilities. You know what I mean? Um, although, you know, I supplied a lot of ergotamine tartrate to people. Um, oh. Some of it came. Some of it came from Jack Leary. Um, um, that made me be able to get a good price on product. You know, I didn't supply any ergotamine tartrate to the cure like people, though I don't think. But you never knew who you're selling it to, you know what I mean? The, the politics of it were, were really, really intense. The thing that really did blow my mind was one time I was getting ergotamine tartrate from Jack Leary, and Leary says to me, I say to him, like we're in this, on the apartment, this was in the very early 70s, and I said, you know, um, how long, what's the shelf life of LSD? You know, I was asking about the shelf life of regarding tartrate, and then I was asking about the shelf life. How long was the LSD good for? And and Jackie, he said, um, five years. And I'll never forget, both of us fell on the floor. We were laughing so hard. We fell on the floor because in our heads, like five years was so far in the future, so impossible to imagine. You know what I mean? Like, it'll last for five years. It'll be like saying, oh, it'll last for 5,000 years. You know what I mean? We were, we were convinced that the whole U.S. society would collapse, that we would win, that we would overwhelm them because we had so much acid. You know I mean? It was just like really a lot of it. I think that I think the a recent interview, um, relatively recent that Henrik Dahl did um with um Tim Scully. Tim Scully said, you know, about how that was what he thought too, that we would be able to overwhelm the forces of evil with the forces of, of LSD light. But really um it's just a non specific amplifier. You know what I mean? Um, the people I knew who were, you know, young, well-fed 60s people had very different trips from people who were like, you know, assholes, because assholes just had asshole trips. <laughs> I mean, it just amplified whatever it was. I did. I never, I didn't get that that was what the phenomenon was. It was just amplification uh, until a few people that were Jesus freaks, we tried to get them to um, stop being religious. And, you know, how will you take, you know, this 2,000 microgram dose with us uh, and still tell us that you uh, believe in Jesus? And because we were sure we'd be able to get that nonsense right out of their heads. Um, but people who do have that Christian delusion, and it is a delusion, um, their delusion strengthened is what we saw was it didn't stop them from believing this bizarre stuff. It, you know, they came out of that, of a, you know, 2000 microgram experience. Yeah. They puked and yeah, we held them in our arms and they went through a rebirth, but the rebirth was about Jesus, you know? Um, and we didn't know that we thought that it would change every single thing. You know what I mean? But one thing I would say, since you're researching the uh, chemistry of it, um, is like, you know, I also, not only did I, you know, I was not only involved in the production of, of clear light and other forms of gelatin doses and tableting machines and and many, many, many millions of uh, sheets of blotter I put out, you know. Um, but I had access and examined like, you know, hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of batches of crystal LSD. And the thing that was so striking was that, you know, you would get stuff that was like, 
uh, black, except if you looked at it from very from a very thin piece of it, it would be like purple. Uh, and you got stuff that was gray, and you got stuff that was mixed. Every color of the rainbow, shape, form, and fashion of crystal, um, which, you know, when you did it out, was, in fact, very potent. But what I saw was that what the, the physical appearance of the crystal LSD or the glompy black liquid or whatever you got it as had nothing to do with goodness of the trips that people had. You know, I mean, if it was white separated crystal, um, you know, and you looked at it in the microscope and you saw that the crystals were all the same and so on and so forth. Yeah, you could get more doses out of that. You know, you could make 25 microgram doses and people did. And then it went right down the line. You know what I mean? And people didn't have as good of trips. Whereas if somebody was like, you know, the clear light experience, um, it was very different. You know what I mean? Like, I'll never forget, I went in Berkeley uh, when I was giving out the samples to people, and I went to the health food store. It's still there. It was a herb store called Loss of Carmack. And uh, I went there, and I, I, the guy, I was buying a bunch of gelatin capsules from the herb store, and the guy said, well, bring me back some of you know what's going in, the, in those capsules, because he thought it was a, some sort of organic psychedelic. And I said... Um, Okay, and then I came back and I said, well, you know, it's acid going in the capsules. And he goes, well, I'm not interested in that acid. I, I only, I only do organic psychedelics, you know. And oh. he and I and I said, well, okay. And I showed him the hits of the clear light, and he said, put it in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, and and it, and I, I like when um, once in the early 70s also, or mid-70s, I believe, or maybe it was the 80s, I can't remember. But anyway, like uh, Albert Hoffman came and he spoke in Berkeley um, at a small, very small club on San Pablo Avenue called Shared Visions. There's a recording of that. And one one of uh, Will Nofke was the um, DJ for it. Uh, But anyway, there was like maybe 30 people there. I was astounded at how the small number of people, and one person asked, uh, Hoffman, something about blah, 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 blah. Well, what about uh, organic psychedelics as opposed to LSD? And he, he sort of, it was the only time where he betrayed any ne- negative emotions. Hoffman said, LSD is an organic psychedelic. <laughs> you know what I mean? He said, it's organic chemistry, uh, ah. you, know? <laughs> you know, which was, you know, telling, I thought. True. Um, That's amazing. Um, and so where were you getting, you said from Jack Leary, but where did ergotamine tartrate come from at that time? Um, Leary, uh, Jackie Leary was also uh, a source of ergotamine tartrate. Um, there was at one point um, in the um, mid to late seventies into like the early eighties, you know, sometime between, I don't know, 77 to um, 82 or 83, right in that period, there was like a tidal wave of ergotamine tartrate. You know what I mean? Um, I was amazed. And junkie, you would go to some guy's house that was a junkie, and he would have like a half a pound of ergotamine tartrate. You know what I mean? Uh, It's done up in ounces as if it were pot in sandwich bags. You know what I mean? Like the guy opens a drawer and he's got all this ergotamine tartrate and sandwich bags. Um, the last time that I moved any, um, it came from a uh, source of mine uh, in Arinda, who is now dead. His name was He was slain in a robbery about 15 years or 20 years ago. But um, some not a drug robbery, just some asshole robbed him and slew him uh, execution style. But at any rate, at one point uh, in the um, late 80s or whatever, I was getting ergotamine tartrate from him and um, in Arinda. And he had two different types. Uh, One type was from Czechoslovakia. People really wanted Czechoslovakian ergotamine tartrate. Um, I couldn't tell the difference, you know, it's just, that's what they're telling me, you know what I mean? Um, but the situation was such that, um, and it's the trust that you don't see in any other drug scenes, as far as I can tell, was like, you know, I go and somebody, you know, fronts me a couple of pounds, this has got to mean tartrate, you know what I mean? 
what they wanted was a certain percentage of the LSD produced. Um, and so I took it and gave it to my other, fronted it to my other, the guy fronted me the guy made sharp tartrate, and then I fronted it to my other friend who, you know, fronted it to his person. Judging by um, how fast they synthesized it and got it back, and, and that I knew it was somewhere in Berkeley, within a few blocks of, of my person's house was where they were doing the work. It was being done here because whatever, but it, it blew my mind was that, you know, the first time when they brought me the product, they brought me something like 200 grams of crystal LSD, uh, and it was folded in a piece of newspaper, okay? They bring me a piece of newspaper, a sheet of newsprint newspaper with like, you know, almost a half a pound of LSD. You know, huh. not, a jet, not a glass jar, not anything with, you know, what you would expect with silica gel inside another container to keep it all away from the moisture and so on and so forth. They just saw it, they were, as if it were weed or something, you know what I mean? Um, people thought that that batch was too clean, you know what I mean? They tableted it, they tableted it out at like 50 micrograms, and people didn't think it was strong enough. They were pissed, you know. They had to. It was. They made it into purple microdots. Um, but you know, people were very guarded about where they or got any tartrate came from. Another person, his name was. Um, not to forget what his name was, but um, he um, he got it from South Africa. Uh, oh, uh, was his name, and he was a very huge dealer in Berkeley. Uh, from the, uh, related to H.L. Mencken, from that family. Oh. Uh, and he was a heroin addict. But, um, you know, he somehow established a connection in South Africa, or so he said, um, and, and got it there. I knew other people who got it from cocaine dealers, basically, who got it in Honduras. Um, they got caught with it, too, uh, in Miami. Um, they let them go or else they worked with the DGA after that, or I don't know what, you know what I mean? Most of the time when I was doing all this stuff, I was a federal fugitive um, because I was arrested in uh, early 1972 with sales of MDA. Um, and that was prior to there being a DEA. It was the BNDD, Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. And then they were totally brutal. I mean, they, they beat me really badly, and then they told me if I didn't cooperate, they would have me killed and in, you know, in prison. And I thought, but they let me go on bail, <laughs> and I moved to Mexico City. But I can only stay there so long, you know. And so I came back, and uh, you know, a sales pitch that I used in my work because basically I wasn't a drug dealer; I was part of like quality control. You know what I mean? I could come in. Uh, and, you know, tablet out your product or, you know, I am not a, you know, synthesist. Uh, I'm not a chemist, but I had enough chemical knowledge to be able to uh, clean up things. In other words, I could buy dark colored crystal LSD from one person and I could make it look different and sell it to another person. Do you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. And so on and so forth. Uh, because the intrigues were really sick. Everybody, you know, most of the people that I moved product to or worked with knew the other people that I'm working with, but you can't say who you got something from. You know what I mean? I get the ergotamine mean, tartrate from one person. I give it to the other person. The person that I'm giving it to, you know, the ergotamine mean, tartrate came from their connection. You know what I mean? Um, but their connection doesn't want them, that person to know that they're moving ergotamine mean, tartrate, et cetera, et cetera. But people, because I was a fugitive, I would say to people, my, tagline was, if I'm at your house, you're safe. You know what I mean? Because I'm not going any place near any cops because they already beat the shit out of me and have threatened me with, you know, going to jail forever. Um, eventually, they caught me, you know, in 1985. And I was in um, Oakland um, on, on College Avenue, and I was using a payphone, you know what I mean? I had a briefcase that had every kind of drug you can imagine in there, including 2CB with a, with a diagrams from the chemist who synthesized it and it was explaining to me what it was, you know what I mean? Um, all this ecstasy that came from a guy who was a, a, my friend, a chemist who was arrested at the 
largest, uh, in 2009, he was arrested at the largest ecstasy lab ever seized in California um, with a shitload of money and everything. Um, but I had all these things in this briefcase. And uh, I was at the payphone, and I was sitting, and I'd been at, at that point a federal fugitive for 13 years. But I had a lot of dope in there, man, a lot of LSD, a lot of everything. And I'm using the payphone to, you know, call it. I was at the time living in this mansion up in the Oakland Hills with these, uh, Coke smuggler guy and pilot and the um and I'm standing there using the phone and this guy comes up and he puts a gun to my head it was so big you couldn't imagine he said um clandestine laboratory task force what's your name and you know I had just had my, a new set of fake ID printed up and I new business cards under that fake name and I said Frederick William uh, uh, fuck you for the first time in my life, because I had lots of close calls and always smoothing my way right through it with fake ID. I couldn't remember the fake name I was using. And the, the narc said to me, your name is, and he gave a list of names. It must have been 20 different names that he had committed to memory. And they were all aliases I'd used over the past 13 years. And then the next thing he said to me, he said, do you want me to take you to a hospital? And I looked at him. He said, you just turned white as a sheet. <laughs> I said, no, it's okay. <laughs> Go ahead and take me to jail. You know what I mean? Um, in, the wow. end, in the end, you know, and, and it was interesting, you know, they were going to, uh, after they dropped me off at the jail, then they went on, they were talking about, they were going down to bust chemicals for research and industry, which was a major, major supplier of chemicals. They were so great. They were like this chemical company in Berkeley. And, um, you know, you could go there and ask them for chemicals. They knew what you were doing and they would give you all kinds of free chemicals and stuff. Like they were really good, but they ended up being fined $50 million uh, and shut down. You know what I mean? Um, it, it, at one point, it's been called zero waste, and then it then it became chemicals for research and industry. I beat the MDA best charge, um, and I uh, ended up being sentenced to two years in federal prison for failure to appear in court. You know what I mean? All the dope I had in the briefcase, they never charged me with it. I never understood why that was. Uh, it was fascinating being in prison. You know what I mean? Like. But the most, the, with, I was there about a week, and it was in Arizona at Stafford, which was a light security prison. It was where John Ehrlichman, the Watergate conspirator, did his time. And um, you know, it was where big wig. There was two types of prisoners, people who used boats and people who used planes, basically. Uh, but I was sitting in the chow hall, and I was adding up you know, the n amount of money at the table where I was eating was more than a billion dollars worth of drugs had been seized uh, from the people at that table. And I'm sitting there talking, and this guy, he looks over at me, and he goes, Berkeley, California, 1971, Golden Hornet Crystal. And I go, what? He goes, I know you. He says, I never met you, but I bought lots of crystal LSD from you. He said, you would be in one room and I would be in the other room. He says, I recognize your voice after all these years. You know, it was 1985, so like 15 years later, which was right on because he was the guy who had the biggest influence in the jail. He'd been in there for a long time for all these boatloads of Colombian weed. And so he ran the jail, basically. And the fact that he knew me and recognized my voice from LSD deals, you know, was right on. My lawyer, I had a free lawyer, not by the state, but my friends went in the phone book when I got busted for the in uh, 1985. And they, and my lawyer, they found a lawyer, who, and the lawyer told me, he said, you know, I'm taking your case. I'm taking it for free. He said because because I took LSD when I was younger and it changed my life, you know, completely. And he said, and that was like, you know, so I'll do, I'll defend you. You know what I mean? So I was really, I was lucky. I agreed to take a five year sentence I, because I had the harshest judge in the federal system, uh, Judge Samuel Conte, and he was the same people that um, sentenced to Owsley and Scully and all these people. And he was a real super asshole judge. And I knew he was going to give me the maximum for the failure to appear. So like, I just said, okay, I'll take five years. And he refused to sentence me to five years. 
it blew my lawyer's mind. You know what I mean? I had packed the courtroom with all these women. Um, you know, I would also say that, you know, um, not only, um, you know, was, did I know Jobs, but also Carrie Mullis. You know what I mean? Oh, no way. Yeah, That's amazing. That, yeah, that was amazing. In fact, he liked these uh, blue pill acid pills. He was a super LSD user. But, you know, what is he made amazing? It. Uh, I believe he tabled it, is what, what I heard. He didn't say anything to me about it, but I, I understood he was with the DA cost conversion as opposed to synthesis, although he was completely smart enough to synthesize, no question. And, you know, the synthesis is, well, as you know, it's not that hard to do, but the thing that's really hard to do is to get a decent yield. But, like, he would hang out, and this is rep- referenced uh by Susie Orman, there was a re- tiny restaurant in Berkeley. It was called the Buttercup Cafe. I mean, it was like the size of a bedroom. And um, Orman was the manager. She was an asshole to me. She, she was the manager. But in her recent, some a few years back, TV lecture, she talked about how, oh, yeah, these guys would come in. And I remember these guys would come in, and they would like uh, they were saying, can you give us free coffee? We're, we're working on this invention that's going to change the world. And it was Steve Jobs, you know what I mean, and Wozniak. And she refused to give him coffee. She says that was the worst decision I ever made in my life. I did. I thought they were deadbeats, you know what I mean. But the, she was a, the waitress, the manager at this tiny place with Carrie Mullis. So you had Susie Orman, the famous financial lady. You had, you know, um, Steve Jobs sitting there drinking coffee, you know, two feet away. And you had the manager who was Carrie Mullis, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like amazing. Um, somebody else was posting online about that in, in a history of Berkeley. And they were, they were going, yeah, what did they put in the order at that restaurant? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but all the people there were really, you know, into drugs. So the, the owner was one of the first casualties of free base cocaine, unfortunately. He didn't die. But I went there one day and they had the the, the IRS came in and they seized the place. You know what I mean? They, the people's food was still on the table. <laughs> they just made everybody get up and leave. Um, so I assume he lost the restaurant. But like, uh, you know, yeah, it was a small, you know, a small world. You know, somebody else that I uh, have taken a lot of LSD around was uh, Jack Dorsey. The, um, you know, the uh, billionaire co-founder of Twitter. Uh, oh, wow. Huh. When he, when he like uh, hung out, he was a punk and he hung out at 924 Gilman, the world famous club in Berkeley. And um, I lived in, in a uh, van there. I was homeless until recently. I was homeless for 27 years living in a van. Um, and I lived right beside, I just camped out in my RV right beside uh, the punk club. So I was really familiar with Dorsey, who was, you know, the doorman. He was the bouncer at the club. You know what I mean? Nobody would have ever in a million years thought that he would amount to anything. You know what I mean? He was a, kind of a jerk guy. And, you know, I got arrested, but I can establish that I was there when he was there because I was arrested there for failure to sign tickets. You know what I mean? Like, they came in, they gave me traffic false tickets and I refused to sign them. So they put me in jail. And I mean, the, the judge dismissed the charges because they were false charges and mutually they were contradicted to one another. So I couldn't have done it, but I forced them to arrest me. And somebody else that I knew well was J.B. Ryan. Do you know who that is? No. He was, he, um, was the guy who originated the term ESP, extrasensory perception. From oh. the Surrey, the Duke Parapsychology Lab. Uh, I'm from. I lived a lot in North Carolina, and I was a um, ESP researcher. At one point, uh, the government took me away from my parents in the eighth grade, and they put me in this converted hospital, uh, and they uh, a research educational research project funded by the Ford Foundation, amongst other people. And uh, they, my project was that they, uh, I studied ESP. And they gave me unlimited funding, no adult supervision, and an office. And I did all these experiments, ESP experiments, uh, on the students there. I was very adept at hypnosis in the eighth grade. 
Uh, that, that may have been why they put me in this special school. It was like a residential school. I mean, my parents weren't allowed to go there. I lived at this place and did these ESP experiments. But because it was in very close to Duke University and the Duke Parapsychology Lab, which Ryan ran, uh, I contacted him, and he gave me a lot of assistance and the uh, uh, Foundation for Research on the Nature of Man, which is the organization he ran. Um, you know, they helped me. I'm astounded um, however, since then, uh, to learn from uh, Michael Horowitz, that's um, the actress Winona Ryder's father, who is somebody I know. Yeah. Um, he um, he has these things, uh, these documents. Rare. There, he's a rare drug book dealer. I was a yeah. drug book dealer too. And you know, these documents were from Sandoz and a representative to uh, J.B. Ryan's lab in the 60s, you know what I mean? So he was involved secretly, Ryan, not only in the ESP stuff, but with psychedelics also. Um, that blew my mind, you know what I mean? Uh, and letters, uh, you know, I believe another letter that it was from Aldous Huxley to Ryan is another rare thing that uh, Michael had. Um, all these things are all connected, you know what I mean? I now, in retrospect, realize that, you know, um, that the book Acid Dreams, that there's a lot of truth in that. I agree with you. Scully said that too. I believe we're never going to really know what the full story was of what was going on. You know what I mean? However, I'm, you know, I'm now wonder how I got away with what I got away with. Maybe, you know, you know, some people I knew were ex military who were heavily involved. I was, I was, I was raised on military bases. Um, because my father was career military. And so until I was 14, I was on military basis. And so I gravitated toward people who had that military discipline in terms of producing and distributing LSD. Um, and I now realize, wow, some of those military people I met who came back from Vietnam and then got introduced to me and they, who were big LSD traffickers, those people may have been something to do with you know, CIA or what have you. But you never know. You mean, you know what I mean? The moment somebody says they're CIA, you know they're not. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, we'll never know the true story, you know what I mean, of what, you know, of what happened. Um, but I will say that the clear light experience was truly, truly one of the most remarkable things. You know, I, I, I never completed it, but I started writing a book called The I forget what I called it, the clear light world or the clear light experience. Because I thought, wow, civilization is going to collapse and we can use this clear light as currency. And I envisioned it as being the money of the future. You know what I mean? The, you know, the early history of clear light, by the way, was that it, it, um, it came, the first stuff that I got was four times larger than the hits, than most hits. The initial stuff that they produced, I believe it was coming out of Santa Cruz, uh, a lab there, um, came in these white plastic boxes. Uh, and, you know, and then after that, uh, they made the hits smaller, but this, of the same potency uh, of the standard size, like a tenth of an inch by a tenth of an inch uh, of the clear light hits. Uh, and it came in sections of surgical tubing uh, that were sealed. You know, once I was carrying some in my mouth because I thought the police were going to bust me and I had this taste in my mouth. I thought it had leaked. I thought, oh, my God, <laughs> it did. You know what I mean? But then it ended up being in those little uh, boxes. But, the, you know, and then later, of course, uh, I was involved uh, in the mid 80s in the uh, production of uh, microdose LSD, uh, which I never got any credit for that. I never got in any trouble. Or either, but like, you know, um, initially they were drop ons, five microgram drop ons on vitamin C tablets and sealed uh, glass bottles that were shrink wrapped and labeled. Uh, and But then later uh, there was blotters, and the first batch of that was 400,000 microdose doses, and it was called Clear Light uh, Microdose. Um, the first batch was called uh, Clear Light brand mind vitamin tablets. They were the vitamin C tablets, but then there was a huge batch that went out there with, uh, you know, labeled instructions with each little, came at 25, five microgram doses, uh, you know, on perforated paper. 
Unfortunately, a large percentage of that got seized by the DEA. Apparently, somebody in front of they said they got seized by the DEA. Um, and, huh. But still, uh, you know, um, it went out there, and people, you know, they were pissed off. It, it, they, I got death threats because of microdose LSD from the LSD community. Serious, I took them serious, serious death threats. People said to me, "Dude, you've been part of this with me for twenty years." I mean, I took LSD. You got to understand, I took LSD at least once every forty-eight hours for more than twenty years. I kept a written record. I took it more than five thousand times, um, and people said, "Dude, you know, you are into high dose LSD, the orange sunshine, the three hundred microgram doses, not the twenty-five to fifty microgram commercial things." And you've always been into we have to change people's lives, and this is, you know, the rebirth experience and all that sort of stuff and and people said i risk my life and my whole life is on this and you too that we would you know these high doses to change people's lives and make them be better people and not go off and fight wars and not be capitalists and you're making this stuff these five microgram doses that reinforce pig pig people you know that makes it easier to be a cop that makes it easier to be you know a, a capitalist you're you're you know emphasizing and helping the bad guys by doing that and because you're doing that we're going to come to your house and burn it down or we're going to kill you or I'll cut your fucking head off you know like the the reaction was very very negative uh, to the you know microdose LSD that's why I'm thrilled now all these years later um, you know, the book by, uh, what's her name here in Berkeley? Um, Michael Chabon's. I left like Waltman or whatever. Yeah. They, 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 they like, uh, I'm glad, you know, that people are now seeing the value of it because I saw a great value. You know, the instructions that I gave people were, you know, fast for three days, blah, 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 and take it, you know, and it, you will have a, a good and wonderful experience. Um, but I never get any credit. I, mean, I read all these books about microdose and all this, you know, press on it and a lot in Silicon Valley. Uh, none of them seem to recognize that for years and years there was lots of microdose LSD on the streets. Uh, it just never was a sellable thing. You know, I made it. I gave it away. I never sold a dose of it. I made, you know, like a thing, really a lot and just gave it away, uh, thinking that it would make the world a better place, you know. Maybe it did. We're all still here. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> My uh, girlfriend, who was a psychiatric nurse, her, her son was having uh, difficulties and he had taken acid and, and he uh, was having, it did not make the problem better. It made it worse. You know, and I don't know if it was autistic or what the thing was, but at any rate, she, uh, and my friend said to her, he said, yeah, uh, some people can't handle LSD. And it causes them to have bad trips. Scully talked about that too. He felt remorse. Um, but he said, um, some people have a bad trip. And he said, and we need to eliminate anybody who cannot handle LSD. He says, we need to purify the gene pool. And that's why all these years I produced so many millions of doses and distributed them, is I want to purify the gene pool by driving crazy anybody who is latently. Um, you know, schizophrenic or what have you. And I refused to have anything further to do with the person after he told me that. I was like, that is so fucking Nazi. The guy was very fluent in German and he was a really Nazi kind of guy that I didn't get that he, you know, thought LSD was a great tool for purifying the gene pool. That Scully was reacted the same way I did when I told him about that. He said, that is horrific. That's one of the most horrific things I've ever heard. I said, yeah, what can you do? All those years you thought the person was a good guy and he, you know, um, wasn't, you know what I mean? He wanted to harm people, you know what I mean? Or that was in his mind. You know I mean? Wow. Yeah. Eugenic psychedelia. I've never even thought of that. Yeah, he he just and I could I was so shocked when he said it to my girlfriend, you know, who was like freaking out about her son, and he's going, well, if he can't handle it, then he should either commit suicide or be institutionalized. We need to get rid of these people. We don't need it. Oh, man, you're saying this to a mother who's freaking out over her son. You're a fucking monster, right? you know. It's like, you know, but you could see that that you know that some people did think that apparently. You know what I mean? 
you saw it on the street level, you know what I mean, where people were like macho about it. I can handle acid and you can't handle acid and I'll steal your old lady and so on and so forth. You know what I mean? Uh, but you never, you know, I never dreamed of somebody at a large scale level would think, yeah, you know what I mean? We can euthanize it. And, it, you know, and it, that person was not a bad person for a long time. I mean, he was my partner and, you know, whenever we didn't money, we thought really was sorted when it came to LSD, a sorted thing that shouldn't be associated. So, you know, if we made money and sometimes it would be thousands upon thousands of dollars, we always tried to have a house that had a fireplace because we just burned all the money. You know what I mean? We do, you know, good hundred dollar bills make excellent kindling. You know, you just put them in the fireplace and burn them all up. You know what I mean? We did not do anything wrong today. You know what I mean? Uh, unfortunately, our girlfriends got together and said, uh, we're not going to be with you anymore if you keep burning all the money. <laughs> you know what I mean? like, <laughs> but it, to me, it made sense. And, and I, you know, I, that somebody who was seemingly that pure in their motivation that they should come to the conclusion that they use it, we're going to use it for, you know, to purify the gene pool was too much for me. You know what I mean? But one thing I, I, I I wrote down some brief notes here. You know, but the one thing that I wanted to mention was that um, what I liked doing, uh, in particular with gel forms of LSD, I made ones that were like they were like clear light, but they were uh, colored. One of them was gray. But what I liked doing was like saving um, all different batches of crystal, and then like making uh, ones for like one. It was like. 14 different batches uh, of LSD crystal and then, you know, mix them and, and they hit so that somebody would have a full body thing. You know what I mean? 14 types of LSD in one dose, um, which to me was like a unique thing. You know what I mean? Um, but I don't think people got it. You know what I mean? It's like, 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 like Tim said, it's set and setting, not you know, pharmacology. I will say this though, as a, somewhat silly sounding aside, but if, you know, if there is an element of seriousness, is I also was, you know, extremely obsessed with the same thing. I wanted to see it synthesized. I wanted to go into a lab and so on and so forth. At one point, at some point, I was really terrified to, to be anywhere near that, but eventually I wanted that. And because it was so impossible to come by that information, I became convinced, well, maybe Maybe it comes from off planet. <laughs> it comes from aliens or something like that. It is not even made by human beings. I mean, that sounds silly, but it was such an incredible impossibility of finding a photograph, you know, of an operating lab that you could actually see. I could read all the descriptions of how to synthesize it. You know what I mean? But I wanted, with my own eyes, to see that happen. And then take the product, and I never did get to see that. You know what I mean? But I don't believe it comes from flying saucers anymore. <laughs> and I never, I never did really. But a few times, I was like, "Well, what other possible reason? There's got to be somebody who would have let the cat out of the bag. Somebody somewhere. You know what I mean? Um, and by the way, I really like that Lemaire film. That was like great. That is really great to laugh, you know what I mean? And I will say, you know, what I said to Tim recently, which was um, Casey Hardison. I was at a show where I was doing security, and uh, and it was a crowded Grateful Dead event. And he was, he came in, you know, I knew, I don't know him, but I knew what he looked like. And somebody I really wanted to talk to. And so, like, he came in, and he was in a crowded room. I mean, there was like 300 people in that room dancing and tripping balls and I looked across the room at him he saw me see him <laughs> I don't know he got out of there I must have climbed out of a window at the back of the venue or something I don't know how he got away I never got to speak to him but I went wow that guy is incredibly incredibly sharp you know what I mean Hardison damn his, his mind is like a you know wow super perceptive that he, he saw just by the look on my face, but clear across the, through that many people. I mean, I'm just speculating, but I think that, that's pretty clear that that was what it was. I looked and I went, wow, 
that's the guy I want to talk to. And he was gone. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry about his story. You know, like, you know, he's like a lot of people. He was eager. You know what I mean? You, you got to understand these narcs are, believe me, they beat the shit out of me, man. You know, and like, you know, they kicked me in the balls until I was puking. And then they said, what are you doing on the floor puking, messing up our, and we told you to, to, to stand up when you talked to us. So they kicked me in the balls until I stood up. And then they said, what? Well, I told you to be on the floor. And then they kicked me in the balls until I was on the floor. You know what I mean? Puking, et cetera. Like these people, they, you know, you know, you get these, I more than anything in the world, I hate marijuana. I think it should be mandatory capital punishment for a single huh. use of marijuana. And you get you get these cops. That's their thing, man. Like, wow. Like, so I'm I'm you know I understand why it's really difficult to find a functioning lab and photograph what's going on. Um, yeah. Because people realize that you know it, should you be caught with an LSD lab, you are in fact facing life. No. No possibility of parole. You know what I mean? That's a serious thing. You know what I mean? You know, me and all of my illegal activities, you know, and I went, you know, like I'm saying, I produced massive amounts uh, of LSD over the course of many years. Um, and I never got caught. I never had to go and kill anybody or to get away or anything like that. It was just, uh, I always had everything packed and every lab space that I had set up, uh, like the one in the picture you mentioned, that opened into a nature area so that I, if I had to escape, you know, it was a escape route going. And it did happen, not at that place, but in numerous places where I was, um, I got away. The police would be coming in. They got everybody else, but I grabbed the dope and got out the back door or, you know, across the roof or what have you. I mean, if I went and visited somebody before I spoke a word to them, I went and discovered all the escape routes, and then I would go in their apartment and speak to them. Um, because otherwise, I saw, you know, wow, well, you know, you're going to have to shoot somebody uh, if you want to stay free, and I'm not, I'm not willing to harm anybody. You know what I mean, I was deeply impressed in my life by Henry David Thoreau and and, um, and Gandhi and all these kind of people. I'm a non very nonviolent person. You know, the thing that convinced me totally of nonviolence for all time and for my life was the first time I took LSD and it was at a beach in Big Sur. Um, two orange tablets, I assume they were scully stuff. But as I started coming on really strong, um, I saw this slaughter scene. You know what I mean? These people had machetes and they were chopping people up. You know, I was having a perinatal experience, I think, you know what I mean? It's described by Stan Groff and people like that. Um, uh, you know, the violence of being born, you know, can trip people out and they can see like violent scenes sometimes on acid trips. And that was what I saw. But it was really, it wasn't color in, enhancement and it wasn't patterns. It looked as if I was seeing a slaughter. It was at a beach. And I, and I thought that people were like chopping people up. And really, if I had had a weapon I might have been tempted to try to defend those people. You know what I mean? And when I realized later that that was a hallucination and it seemed so incredibly realistic, I went, well, I can never, ever be violent in my life because I may be hallucinating. You know what I mean? It made me realize that, you know, reality is just what we, you know, see and so on and so forth. That, you know, to take radical, violent action based on my sensory input was wrong. You know, it means that I, you know, I could never be violent and, and that stuck with me, you know, forever. You know, unfortunately, I saw it didn't stick with other people. You know what I mean? They went right ahead. You know, the thing that I saw that was like totally the, the destructive, there was the LSD scene in Berkeley was so beautiful. It really was a wonderful thing in like 1969 1970 and like that. Um, but cocaine came in, you know, and like that changed everything. That really, what an ugly experience it was. I mean, I was like everybody else. I liked cocaine. You know, I got strung out on it just like everybody else. But, but like it made people greedy. You know what I mean? It, whereas LSD is, um, ego dystonic, you know, um, Cocaine is egocentric. You know what I mean? It's the polar opposite. You know, it strengthens your ego, uh, and that really caused people to be greedy, and uh, you know, and it, and it ultimately crashed the clear light scene. In my opinion, even though people wanted to buy 
the cheaper product. The dealers wanted it. The public still wanted clear light. But what happened was there was a lot of counterfeits that came out. You know what I mean? One of the ones that was the weirdest counterfeit ever was people, you know, when you get a pack of cigarettes and it has like a cellophane wrapper on the pack of cigarettes, yeah. and it has that little that little red piece of thing and you pull it and it and all the way around the top of the pack and then you can open the cellophane, you know, it's like a sort of a zipper like thing. That yeah. little piece of people took that because it was the same width as a hit of clear light and they would cut that into pieces that looked like clear light. You know what I mean? It was from cigarette packs <laughs> and they would sell it on the street. You know what I mean? But like other people, you know, they just like, um, you know, they were, the other thing that caused a real problem was that up until, um, you know, the mid seventies and really up until the nineties, as far as I could tell, or the late eighties, mid eighties, um, there wasn't much crystal LSD. You know, you could get lots of tabs and you could get clear light and you could get it in a variety of forms, but they was a real, the labs and the people producing and the, you know, the um, preparation of the doses did not want there to be crystal LSD go out there. Uh, and so, you know, when it became so that, you know, 17 year old deadheads could get crystal LSD, it caused all kinds of, you know, major problems. There were a lot of, you know, cult type things out there. You know what I mean? Um, some of which I only, you know, know from pamphlets and things that I got at uh, bookstores where people were saving LSD literature for me. Um, but like, uh, it really, you know, it people really do. It really causes you to want to form cults. You know what huh. I mean? Um, I tried to avoid that completely, you know what I mean? Especially when it was directed at me, you know what I mean? Wow, will you be the head of my cult? <laughs> type of vibe from people. I'm like, no, you don't understand. That's not how I want it to be, you know what I mean? I want it to be like free thinking as opposed to some guy at the top is going to tell me what to do, you know what I mean? One of the, you know, One thing that was weird in Berkeley was you had like, government people come like guys in business suit these guys in the business suits one day on the street you know they said hey we're like government chemists and we stole all of these drugs and do you want to try some of them and they took me around the corner and they um, had suitcases filled with powder drugs and they, the one that they turned me on to was a diethyl tryptamine DET I remember I was I was like doing an Australian crawl on the sidewalk <laughs> swimming up the street after I did it you know what I mean the other guy had a cult in Oakland and it was a, a toluene cult and, and my friends got hooked into it um, they got hooked into it when they were on a clear light trip actually and they um, and they switched bodies they had never met each other. And then for the next six months, they never spoke to each other, but they just like were one unit in two different bodies. You know what I mean? Each they sort of weird switched bodies, but they got hooked up with this cult in Oakland and it was for toluene. And the guy had a 50 gallon barrel of it, you know, basically glue sniffing. And every morning my friend would take, they had a boxes and boxes of Ziploc bags and, and a big box of white washcloth. And he would, in front of, they had this expensive, large house in Oakland, the guy that ran it, that was the cult guy. And my other friend was his lead, you know, priest. And he would dip the the white washcloth in the toluene, and then he would put it in the gallon Ziploc bag, and he would hand them out to the people. And they called the washcloth soaked in the, in the toluene the lamb. This is the lamb of the Lord. You know what I mean? And I was like, man, <laughs> they came to my house. I took their washcloth from them and I threw it up on the roof. They climbed up on the roof and got it back. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I often wonder, was that a government research project? What the hell? You know what, what, was, I, what was the name of that group? I I don't know. They, they never really had a, an official uh, name. You know what I mean? I will say that um, at the um, North Carolina Advancement School, which is that place I was talking about where the government uh, had me do ESP research, um, 
the thrust of my research there, I knew about LSD. I'd read about it, but I had no way to get my hands on it. Um, it was legal at the time. Um, so I used a glue, uh, specifically Sandberg's rubber cement glue. And I did all these ESP tests on people after I hypnotized them, and sometimes without hypnotizing them, and had them sniff glue and do these ESP tests. You know what I mean? Um, I had one guy who could, who appeared to be able to influence the flight path of uh, SDS Industries model rockets. We did all these tests to see if there was they could psychokinetically uh, cause a rocket to, to go to one side or the other. And he appeared to have that. And I had another person who, with the Zener card test, which has like five different symbols, it's a standard ESP test. And, and there's 25 cards, five of each. And the person tries to guess, is it a wavy line, a heart, a circle, you know, and there were these five symbols. And I had a guy who, in his normal, I kept a, uh, you know, as I would have them guess the run of the cards, I would write down what they guessed each card was. And his, most people, it was just chance, you know what I mean? And, but I kept a record of each time that they did it. You know, I mean, I would test them like 20 times in a row. And I had one guy when I went back and he was guessing three runs ahead. And he was guessing sometimes with 100 percent accuracy. In other words, he was guessing three couples down the road and was guessing 100 percent accurate, according to my crude eighth grade and not so scientific research. You know what I mean? But since then, you know, I've, it's something I regret in some ways because I've thought if the government got those results and they probably they were already hanging out with Ryan and so they had to do parapsychology labs so they probably did know about my results and if somebody could influence the flight of a model rocket and if somebody could guess the order of the cards with a hundred percent accuracy before they were shuffled, even you know, even though my test was not nearly scientific rigorous. If the government heard that, I'm afraid they went and took those people away from their parents. And they, you know what I mean? They're telling them what happened to them. You know what I mean? The government would not be nice if they thought you could influence the flight of a rocket. You know what I mean? So I have, you know. But it was interesting that the glue, uh, toluene, basically, and so on and so forth, and I perceived that that, you know, might. Um, influence or psychic phenomena. It's because I had read that book by Cavana and Servadio, uh, Experiments with LSD-25 and Psilocybin or something like that. It was like a 1964 book, I believe. Yeah, I had to steal a copy from a, a medical library to get my copy. It's the only book I ever stole. I wanted that book so bad. <laughs> oh, well. In my lifetime, according to the IRS, my entire lifetime, I'm, I'm, just, I'm approaching 70, my entire lifetime earnings is $2,143. In more than 50 years, that was how much money I made. You know what I mean? Um, I, of course, you know, in, in my not career of nonprofit quality control, because that's how I thought of myself in the LSD scene, um, people paid my bills. You know what I mean? That was what I worked for. If you pay my rent, I'll, you know, package this for you or I'll tablet this out for you and so on and so forth. Um, but it meant that, um, you know, anything that I have, I had to put in storage um, because I was homeless, like I'm saying, for 27 years. It was, the only reason I'm not homeless now was I had a stroke in December. Um, and so now I'm in a uh, old folks dying home. Yeah, you know, I, I, I want to say that that was one of the, uh, aside from LSD, that was one of the most awesome experiences in my life. I'm sitting at the library, you know what I mean, which is like 30 seconds away from an ambulance, and that's why I went to this library every day for 10 years and, and went online. And so, because it was close to an ambulance, and I, in case I needed something. And sure enough, in December, I was sitting there, and suddenly, I couldn't send an email. I couldn't make the cursor go and click on send. And I couldn't speak, and then I completely lost control of my body. Comple I couldn't move either of my arms or my legs, and I couldn't speak. And it happened in the space of like 10 seconds. If I had been driving, oh my God, I would have been toast. 
You know what I mean? And so would have a lot of other people. If I had been in the panel van where I've been living for all those years, they would have never found me because I'm a very paranoid person who you know hides out in their van and people that know me have instructions never to come near my van. So it would have been really, really drastic. They rushed me to the emergency room because the ambulance was right there. They came instant. People at their library, they saw half of my body was drooped, you know what I mean? And they saw, oh my God, it's a classic stroke. And they called the ambulance. The ambulance rushed me to the hospital and they shot me up with TPA. Um, and like um, from Genentech, the technology. And and uh, it was all the bot caught in my brain and apparently I've recovered fully with you know, ne- no negative effects but that can no longer be a homeless person like I did for the past 27 years and sleep in the alleyways and bands and things because I uh, because of that stroke I realized I'll be dead you know what I mean so now I'm in this really horrific all folks home where they do not believe um, that there is any such thing as the coronavirus they believe it's a hoax Oh man! And so the people who are preparing the food here, you know, they're coughing their guts out every day, and they're preparing the food. They don't wear face masks. You know what I mean? You know, two blocks away, they just fifty-nine people just came down with the COVID virus. Six of them died. You know what I mean? This within sight of where I am in a similar facility. So I'm assuming. In fact, on Facebook, if you go to my Facebook page, I've been, and I'll say it to you. I've, saying my goodbyes to people because I think I will probably get it and because of my age I will probably die but there's a good chance of that so it's with sadness I'm you know, saying goodbye to everybody I would say to you keep up the good work <laughs> you know what I mean um, oh man I, well take care of yourself I'm really sorry to hear about your circumstances yeah it's really scary you know what I mean it, it, it is one of the scariest things because I know what to do to not get this and I can't get people to, you know, I mean, people are threatening my life. What do you mean? I can't come within six feet of you. You're a racist prick. How dare you tell me you blah, blah, blah. And, you know, coming over and rubbing their, their, rubbing their face and then putting their hand and rubbing my face. And people are really, wow. You know what I mean? Like, it's incredible. This is a, the whole facility is filled with people who are um, mentally ill, severely. I'm not mentally ill. But if I talk to my doctors or me, the medical people, the moment I tell somebody I took LSD 5,000 times, nothing I say after that will they listen to. You know? <laughs> maybe, maybe it's better to keep that to yourself. Although I, of course, <laughs> yeah. understand that it's, uh, you know, to people that, that know it's if anything, a sign of your sanity. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, uh, like uh, you know, but I I had not realized that the fear of LSD is still that strong. And, and I, this is a maybe an odd question to ask so late in the conversation, but what is your name? Um, I'm not going to give out my name. Um, okay. I, the, I use the two names that I use uh, are J-D-Y-F, Three three three. That's my online, you know, name. And the Vivid Rose um, is the other one. Um, if you know, I give enough information on Flickr and enough information in this blog that if a person was the man, you know, what I mean, they could figure out who I am. Um, you know, I give my you know date of birth and stuff like that. You know, what I mean, it's like. I don't want to, I'm not trying to hide so much from the cops as, um, my family members. You understand, you understand that like, uh, I came from a very conservative family and there's only one of my family, immediate family still left alive. But, um, but my dad was like, you know, a KKK guy and a real Nazi type bastard, you know what I mean? Who beat me and threw me out and so on and so forth. So I, you know, kept my identity secret because I didn't want there to be blowback on my family. Um, uh, it's not that I don't trust uh, people and so on and so forth. Um, you know, suffice it to say, I'm, you know, I'm the, as I say in the autobiography, um, are you familiar with the Andy Griffith show, Mayberry and all that sort of stuff? Oh, uh, only the name. I've never seen it. 
you're a pure soul and you're lucky don't see it and your life will be better <laughs> anyway i come from a, a you know the, the straightest redneck my grandmother was you know andy griffith's sunday school teacher and so on and so forth um moonshiners from mount airy north carolina which was the fictional mayberry on television all, all those years with these programs with this sheriff guy and that's who you know, Andy Griffith show is, um, but a very, in other words, a very straight background. Um, and so I, you know, have kept my, you know, identity secret. You know what I mean? That was what my total shock when the cop went down the list and named every name I'd ever used. You know what I mean? Most of them, they apparently got from Western Union. Um, you know, hmm. but it used to be, <laughs> it used to be you could send the money. And you didn't have to show ID to pick it up. There was just a test question. In my case, it was how many days are in the week? Um, 21 was the answer. And if you said 21, then the Western Union people would give you the money. So I was able to transfer funds all over the country, all over the world, um, without having to use a name, um, so on and so forth. And so, I, you know, I got away with it. Plus, I was like, you know, uh, adamantly against the war, and I still to this day do not know uh, what warrants are out for my arrest. There probably are uh, relating to anti-war activities. Although I'm not a you know really a destructive person, um, I also did not like the war machine. You know what I mean? And was really extremely pissed off about the the, the draft. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, I'll I'll dedicate my life to stopping you motherfuckers. I wrote them, you know what I mean? Please come and arrest me. At first, you're going to have to find me. Um, that was my shock when the guy knew all my name, all of my, but, and, and you know, the weirdest thing, I will say this about that as a aside was when he said all those different names, the narc, when the, the, you know, clandestine laboratory task force guy. When he said that, I was freaked the fuck out. <laughs> and he goes, and he tells me all those names. And then they took me over to the federal building in San Francisco. And they said, your name is this. And the name that they thought I was, wasn't my real name. Okay. Huh. It was an alias. And I said, well, that's not my real name. Cause I knew the kid was up, you know what I mean? And so I was like, this is my real name. And I told them my real name. And they said, we know where your daughter is and you know, we're going to go to her elementary school and we're going to take her away and you'll never see your daughter again. If you lie to us again about your name. And so they insisted that my name was an alias. They threatened my daughter. They would say, if I didn't say that my name was the alias, of course, you know, the fingerprints came back and they did go, Oh, well that really is your name. You know what I mean? Uh, but even then, it was so weird, man. They put me, I did the two years in prison, uh, and they like, or 15 months actually, um, they, they used the wrong name, uh, in prison, the, my name, and they mixed it up. And so, and I said, but that's not my name. And, and they said, sorry, once the prison system says that's your name, it becomes your name. So, you know what I mean? I said, but you're in, I'm here for failure to appear in court, and you never told that person to go to court. You know what I mean? How can that be? You know what I mean? And it's interesting because um, the judge who sentenced me to the two years when they uh, when they caught Nick Sand there in Canada, and they brought him back to that same judge, uh, and they were charging him with failure, same thing, failure to appear. And it was the same judge, Conti, as me. He said, his lawyer said, prove that you told him to come to court. And they couldn't. And so they dismissed that. You know what I mean? He beat the thing I went to prison for because they couldn't prove. But I didn't have the opportunity to do that. You know what I mean? Um, and I was glad because I didn't want to. I was facing 40 years for the MDA charge. And, you know, because of the Speedy Trial Act, what happened was it had been 13 years before, and they microfilmed the details of the case and sent them to the East Coast. And my lawyer demanded uh, a speedy trial, and they couldn't find the records. So apparently they dismissed those charges and just sentenced me on the uh, failure to appear in court type of thing, which I could have beat, like I'm saying, a 
seems like I could have beat it, but my lawyer was just like, let's, let's let it go at that. And I'm like, okay. But one thing I did learn is you don't want this to ever happen to you. You don't want to ever be charged with a felony because, man, that slams all these doors closed. It's incredible. My life, because I got that felony conviction, it's a felony to not. It's a felony to not appear in court to face charges that you weren't found guilty of. But that's what it was. I went to prison for failure to appear to face charges that I wasn't found guilty of. You know what I mean? Some cops said, wow, that's so sad, including the warden in the prison. He says, you don't belong here. <laughs> I'm going, I know. He says, you're your typical Berkeley guy. You took that LSD and you think you can change the world. I said, I did. <laughs> he said, you don't belong here, but oh, well. <laughs> okay. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, thank you so much for your time, and I hope and please stay safe, and I hope you uh, you make it through all this. Yes, um, I you know, but even if I don't, I've had a good run, and I'm really happy about that, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, and thank you for the work you're doing. Really, it's extremely, extremely, extremely important that people learn about this and know about this. If if nothing else, it's for the, you know, the Darren the, the mayors and people like that out there, um, the one in a million, one in 10,000 people who will pick up on this information and use it right on uh, in a good way. You know what I mean? So they're like, yeah, it's a, I, I don't like religion, so I'm not going to call it a holy mission, but, you know, pretty damn close. <laughs> okay. All right. Have a good night. Thank you so much.